All right, here we go. Our first chapter in our applied or applications of social psychology. And clearly what we're going to start with here is um, things that influence clinical judgments. Um, and what, what this is really all about is, you know, social judgments. Um, any form of judgment and decision making is going to come in into play in a, in a clinic. But before we talk about that, let me just very briefly give you a back. Uh, where, where does this stuff come from? Um, if, you know, it, origins of clinical psychology are actually fairly new in in the manifestation that we might see it today but it, it often began often can be considered to be a, begun with Emil Kraepelin he worked with Wilhelm Wundt and um, Wilhelm Wundt was trying to classify sensations he was trying uh, anyway he, he was an interesting character by himself but Kraepelin was working with Wundt and saw how Wundt was classifying sensations and see saw that um, he could classify symptoms of mental disorders. That the symptoms of mental disorders did not just appear randomly in patients, but instead clustered together in certain ways. And this notion of understanding the clustering of mental disorder, or symptoms rather, became the basis of the modern DSM as we know it. Uh, the, quote, father of clinical psychology was Leitmer Wittmer. And I always want to make sure we put Leitmer Wittmer out there whenever we're talking about clinical psychology. Because he established what, well, he was trained as an experimental psychologist, right? His diploma was in experimental psychology. But he firmly, firmly believed that all clinicians for, should be first and foremost scientists. He established the scientist practitioner model, a model of clinically, clinically related even, you know, or counseling related psychology that I find to be critical. So clinical psychology implies that a, a practitioner is a scientist first. First a scientist, then a practitioner. So the science must become before the application. And that should be in any discipline, whether you're talking IO, psych, or whatnot. The scientist should come first, and then the applications second. So psychotherapy as a definition, anyway, any attempt. And that's key, by the way, attempt. Um, because there were some crazy forms of psychotherapy in the past, including like trefining and cutting holes in skulls and spinning people and burning them and attempt. Okay, and so I'm I'm not going to go into the whole models of mental or mental illnesses and things of this nature, but I mean it's all cool for another course. Now, what I'm going to do though, and this is this graph scares some living by Jesus out of me. So. Uh, who is this? Nunez, Pool, and blah blah blah. These these people here, these these ladies here, from the looks of it, they um looked into a you know they classified psychologists as either clinical or non-clinical, and then they asked a simple question: There are alternative ways of knowing for which the scientific method is irrelevant that should be valued and supported in in the practice of clinical psychology. Okay, and so all of a sudden. Clini the non-clinical psychologist basically said, hell no, look at that. On the left side, they completely disagreed. Very, very, very few people showed, expressed any level of support for this statement. Okay. However, look at the clinical psychologists. You see a few of them here on the far left that would really, you know, these ones, twos, and threes might be truly taking the scientist practitioner model. But by the time you get over to six and seven, you you have fundamentally rejected the scientist practitioner model. I mean, you've, you've simply said science doesn't count. And I'm, wow, okay, whatever. So when making clinical judgments, there's a lot of things that might influence. And one of the most important is illusory correlations. Illusory correlations can happen anywhere. You know, you can, you can get them in a slot machine, think that there's something there. I mean, it, it, it's like uh, an illusory correlation. I sneezed, the light turns on. There was no relationship between the sneezing and the lights turning on, but guess what? After that, therefore, because of that, and I I come to believe the sneezing cause. So what we find is that um, you can get this notion of illusory correlation, or 
heck, superstitions. B.F. Skinner did some fascinating work with pigeons and superstitions, and he could get a pigeon to do all kinds of crazy crap that had nothing to do with getting food. Well, if we believe that a certain type of person will give a certain type of response, and we'll, we'll, we'll remember those situations where we saw it, and perhaps discount those cases where it didn't happen and so a lot of clinicians put a lot of faith into the Rorschach you know and you see what I got up there no to the Rorschach um, there's no relationship at all between responses on the Rorschach inkblot and anything you can read all of these words that are here on this page because there's an awful lot of them but what it's going to tell you is there is nothing Rorschach is unrelated to any anything and yet many many clinicians will swear by the Rorschach despite no not just no evidence but I mean evidence for nothing okay it's a scary world so here is a classic uh, classic study shall we say uh, basically being sane in an unsane place I, I put a link here to the some of the original stuff here but this is David Rosenhan and basically he wanted to know about um, how how well could mental health professionals really tell who was mentally healthy and who wasn't I mean how good a job do they do okay wanted to know something about you know is it possible that maybe the situation creates the symptoms creates the disorders etc and so here's what he did he got eight what he called pseudo patients so these are people without mental disorders and he had them pretend to be mentally ill and then go and get admission into the hospital okay five men three women different backgrounds um all kinds of people as you can see here and so their job was to go they had called different hospitals up different coasts set up appointments they show up and they say I'm hearing voices saying empty hollow and thud I mean this is it right and so all patients were admitted with the diagnosis of schizophrenia so across the board they all got admitted with schizophrenia uh, there. so as soon as they were admitted okay no more symptoms do not exhibit a single symptom at this point you've done it you're in go and so now is your job to find a way to get out so every single person when they were when they were were released they were discharged with the label schizophrenia in remission okay so what we find is that um, on average what was it here under my head so it took 7 to 52 days with an average of 19 Wow 52 so here's what happened these patients were instructed to take notes while they're in the hospital you know I want you to write down how you're being treated how other people are being treated relationships among patients etc and so there was a lot of um, uh, physical abuse of patients um, powerlessness even with the pseudo patients who knew that they weren't even mentally ill and so what happened was that um, through all of these notes they found that the daily contact was what is it 3.9 uh, an average of 6.8 minutes contact between patients with psychiatrists psychologists residents physicians anything any of the medical staff an average of 6.8 minutes a day okay out of 24 hours a day that's not much contact so some people said hey maybe let's think let's see this in reverse okay let's let's check this out it doesn't feel right and some of the critics actually said you know if you're if you walk into a mental hospital complaining about hearing voices that's like a major thing it's like going into a, a um, an emergency room vomiting blood I mean you know it's gonna trigger some pretty big it's like a big warning sign so that's not fair so let's look at this in the opposite so what they did was they went back to these hospitals and they told the staff okay I want you to rate on a 10 point scale from very confident to un, you know whatever whether or not you think somebody's a pseudo patient a fake patient and across three months there was 193 admitted patients and 41 were, were rated you know at, we believe this is a fake patient 23 by a psychiatrist 19 were rated they thought this guy's fake by both a psychiatrist and a staff member and of course as you can guess there was absolutely zero pseudo patients oh okay it really was a powerful study 
showing that these labels that we are giving people can become self-limiting, self-confirming. Um, the hospitals couldn't really tell the difference between who was in fact mentally healthy and who was mentally not healthy. Well, what's scary is that um, this is how it kind of works in more, you know, again, we're, we're in the clinical judgments. If a clinician suspects a diagnosis, they're going to ask patients about, so I have a suspicion, and so this is just fundamental human nature. When you have a, an idea about something, we seek information to confirm what we already believe. So the clinician expects uh, uh, something and says, do you have this symptom? All right. And so, as an example, I mean, in many cases, by the way, the relationship between patients and doctors is a is a relationship of status, one of far, far higher status than the other, and often a situation where uh, we want to please the person in charge or something. So when my daughter was young, we would go to the doctor, regular doctor, right? And the doctor would be like, does it hurt here? And she'd be like, yeah. It didn't matter where she, you know, where she was asked because it just, and then it's, it would confirm what the doctor believed. Oh, then there's a problem here. Okay, and so all of a sudden the confirmation leads to even further problems. So what we find is most clinicians believe that they are very good at diagnosing. But the fact is they're really not, okay? They're not good at diagnosing. And so in a, in a fascinating study, what they'll do is, you know, um, psychiatric patients are being, you know, they're going to be released today, and we want you to predict whether or not they will, in fact, be readmitted to the hospital. Okay? Will they be readmitted? And so the clinicians make an estimate. And then they measure the thickness of the patient's medical file. And it turns out the thickness of the patient's medical file is a better predictor of readmission than the, the clinical psychologist's ideas. Okay, And this is a powerful thing that something as stupid as thickness of patient's medical files does a better job than... A, a trained doctor? Yeah, unfortunately it does. Okay? In a classic example uh, representation of this, they call you know the case of Joseph Kidd. And Joseph Kidd, it, they, they read a case study in four parts. And so then after you know the first portion of it, they asked people, what is the diagnosis, right? Is this, in a, I, I mean, different answers correct. And they, after each one, they said, how confident are you? So they asked them to get some answers and then confidence in it. And so you can see as, as people got more and more information from part one to part two to part three to part four, there's very little change in the purple bars, which is accuracy. So there's very little change in accuracy of diagnostic statements. But look at what's happening to the confidence that people have in reporting their, their accuracy. All right, They believe they are correct, but they're not getting any better. Ooh, depressing. All right, so that's what we got on this first part about clinical judgments, and see you in a few minutes.